LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and I'm delighted to welcome back Anthony Peake, who joins us to discuss his recent book, The Infinite Mindfield, the quest to find the gateway to higher consciousness. The Infinite Mindfield uses as its starting point the widespread historical belief that the pineal gland, the so-called third eye, is a profoundly important organ. It links this to the various myths originating in ancient Sumer that dragons or serpents have guided humanity and presents evidence that these beings are symbolic of DNA. It is now known that DNA gives off a form of light known as bioluminescence. This information-rich inner light needs an organ of sight to process it, and that organ is the pineal gland. It is through this small organ that we perceive the inner worlds of lucid dreaming, out-of-body experiences, hypnagogic imagery, near-death experiences, astral travel, and the Kundalini experience. For thousands of years, voyagers of inner space such as spiritual seekers, shaman, and mystics, have returned from their inner travels, reporting another level of reality that is more real than the one that we inhabit in waking life. Others have claimed that under the influences of mysterious substances and psychedelics, that the everyday human mind can be given glimpses of this multidimensional realm of existence that is usually hidden from us by our five senses. Using information from the cutting edge of modern science, Anthony presents a startling new hypothesis that these inner worlds are as real, or possibly even more real, than the reality we experience in waking life. The infinite minefield ends with the mind-blowing proposition that all living beings are one unitary consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. As with our previous interview with Anthony, there were ghosts in the machine. So instead of the usual intro, we just dive straight into the interview. Anthony, building on some of the work uh, for your previous books, uh, we're bringing together ideas from cutting edge science and spirituality. It seems with the infinite minefield that you really wanted to take some of the key information presented in those previous works to a completely different level. Uh, for a long time, I felt that although the hypothesis presented in the earlier books has a degree of rationality to it, and it does manage to explain some of the greater mysteries of of living, such as the the near-death experience, deja vu, precognition, and such like. I felt sometimes that there was a danger that it was getting somewhat somewhat inward-looking and was in a danger of being accused of being solipsistic in the sense that if we are living in our own kind of um, computer game, for want of a better term, the difficulty would be is how we uh, how we understand the existence of other minds. Now, I know that in philosophy, this has been a great question for centuries, but effectively, I didn't want to be going down that trap. So I was looking into um, alternative ideas and, and, and hypotheses about the nature of consciousness and consciousness in its relationship with reality. And um, I was delighted to come across the work of Professor Irvin Laszlo, um, and Laszlo, in fact, had written the foreword for my um, my my book, The Out-of-Body Experience. And that was where I started to think along the lines of, um, can consciousness be explained in a far more subtle and powerful way in the sense that uh, consciousness exists as part of an extended field, um, which is external to us all, that we effectively attune into in one way or another. And the book was an attempt to evaluate the infam- evaluate the evidence that this is such a, as there is such a, a belief system and such a case and i wanted to do it in a, a, tw- a twin pronged attack i wanted to do the history and the philosophy and the theology of these concepts uh with also tying it in with the hard science 
And this is effectively what I attempt to do in the infinite minefield. And I'd like to believe that I succeed in this quite difficult task that I gave myself. Now, you examine a lot of ancient civilizations and identify commonalities between them in terms of practices and beliefs that pass from one to another. And this incorporates also all the major world religions. And what all of this is pointing to really is some ancient common source. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I effectively, my writing, if, if when, when people encounter the book, you'll find that what I write about is, is based on solid history. So I'm not jumping to any wild conclusions. I'm not doing an Eric von Daniken. Um, what I'm doing is looking at the facts as they stand and looking at the archaeological information, uh, the philological information, the linguistic information, and what this can tell us about the cross-fertilization of ideas across various civilizations. And what I do is I take the myself and the reader, we go on a journey along the Silk Road. So effectively starting off in the, the, the oldest civilizations that we, we really have any form of direct record of, uh, the, uh, the Sumerians, and looking into the, 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 the belief systems of Sumer, and what they what they believed in, you know, so effectively, you know, within Mesopotamia, what was it um, that their religious systems believed in? And I was surprised to discover that if you look at the 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 Mesopotamian civilizations, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Assyrians, and ultimately the Babylonians, they all had that their their religious belief system was based upon a very similar source, and this was the source was the idea that some form of um, civilization came before them, whether this civilization was an alien civilization, whether this was another lost civilization that was human, is I don't really try to answer. But if you look at the legend of the Anunnaki and the idea of who the Anunnaki were, they were supposedly people who had come from elsewhere and brought ideas with them and uh, knowledge of, of how to, to grow crops and, and circulate crops and everything else. It seemed that this information seemed to just come from elsewhere. And you look at the legends of, of Marduk and the Niburu, Niburu and the ideas of the winged disc of Marduk. Now, if you look at the winged disc, what you find is that this has a profound amount of symbolism in it. Uh, and it seems to me that what they were trying, what the information is telling us is that there was something powerful going on here deep in history where we were being given information. Humanity were being given information from somewhere else. And the question was, wh where was that somewhere else? Now, the, 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 the word Anunnaki actually means uh, beings who from heaven to earth came. Now, again, to me, that is a is that well, I don't know. Is it an odd way of describing your fellow human beings? I mean, effectively, if you were calling them specifically gods, you would call them gods. But they don't. They say they're beings who from heaven to earth came as if they came down from somewhere. Their knowledge of um, Lawrence Gardner uh, describes the Anun Anunnaki as being clinical technologists, you know, effectively their knowledge of anatomy was was powerful so it seems that that they had knowledge that that to a degree even we don't have at the moment now if you then start looking at their belief system you find some quite interesting themes you know they seem to be preoccupied with brain structures and the way the brain functions and everything else and i then started to look into what modern day civilization, religious belief system, which would have been seeded in that part of the Fertile Crescent uh, in Mesopotamia and, 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 and seeded downwards. And the, one of the oldest religions, and the, the, definitely the oldest monotheistic religion in the world is Zoroastrianism. Now, I wondered whether the Zoroastrians, because of the, the great age of Zoroastrian religion, was whether there were links between Zoroastrianism and these earlier belief systems. Now, if you start looking into Zoroastrianism, it becomes very, very peculiar. Because 
the modern day Zoroastrians um, effectively are the Parsis, who are um, people of Persian origin who now live in the, the Mumbai area. OK, and they left um, around about the 7th century AD. The Parsis left Persia and moved over the Persian Gulf from the Arabian Sea to Gujarat in India, and they continued there. Now, their belief systems are absolutely stunning because they they believe that um, we are all dual beings, that there is for every human being, there's a guardian spirit that's born called a Favashi. And the, the Favashi then carries all the information of past lives within it. And not only this, but they believe that sacred to their whole belief system of Zoroastrianism is light and fire, but particularly the pineal gland, that very, very small organ at the center of the brain, because the turban even worn by Zoroastrians is, is worn to protect the pineal gland from what they call cosmic rays. They actually call it, the, within Zoroastrian terminology, the, the, the actual um, pineal gland is called the AP. OK, and the best thing for protecting the, the AP is white cotton. Now, they also say that, that they believe that the pineal gland gains power from light. In other words, light itself is the thing that actually generates the power of the pineal gland. So suddenly we've got this very, very ancient belief system that is discussing structures within the brain that subsequently in the book I start discussing the modern knowledge of the role of the pineal gland. And these guys knew it. You know, they, they were already aware of the light processing abilities of the pineal gland. So what is this telling us about these civilizations? Because if you start moving along and you assume all civilizations feed all other civilizations, one assumes that the, the, the ideas of ancient Sumer um, would have fed across to ancient Egypt, which they did. They then fed eastwards into the Tibetan plateau, where they, they, they seeded some very, very interesting religious belief systems based upon the Bon tradition, which is the original shamanic tradition of um, the Tibetan plateau, which, which is now part of Buddhism. And again, you get all these themes all the way through. You get the themes of the pineal gland, you get the themes of light, and it clearly is linked. Now, what is most intriguing about all this is you can take it down into Hinduism. And Hinduism has the same kind of ideas that there is some form of light forms which are inside the body. You then go into the belief system of uh, prana and the, 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 the power that runs through the body and runs up the spine. You then discover the Kundalini experience they talk about, and that involves a form of energy running up the two channels of the spine, the Ida and the Pingala, and firing up from the, 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 the bottom of the spine into the center of the brain, where it explodes into the pineal gland, and it enlightens the pineal gland. So we have some fascinating things here. Now, just very quickly, just touching upon something that really intrigued me and something that I had never come across before, is there is a particular form of Hinduism called Kash Kashmiri Shaivism. And Kashmiri Shaivism have specific beliefs to do with the pineal gland. So you suddenly find the pineal gland is the universal belief system. But then you move westwards and you get into um, Egypt and ancient Egypt. And suddenly, if you start looking into the sacred geometry of the buildings of ancient Egypt, the so symbolism suddenly starts to scream out at you because you suddenly find that the, for instance, um, uh, uh, um, an Egyptian friend of mine or an American who's married to an Egyptian lady called Patricia Awan. And Patricia Awan runs the Kemet, school, the, the Kemet School in Luxor. And she pointed out to me and she said, even the pyramids themselves are symbolic of the pineal gland. And I said, really, how's that? And she said, what's your knowledge of Greek? And my knowledge of Greek is, is, is passable. And she said, what's the translation of the word, word pyramid into Greek? And of course, the Greek, the, the pyramid is a Greek word from two Greek, Greek words, pyra, midus, fire in the middle. Now, the fire in the middle 
if you calculate the brain, is the pineal gland. So suddenly we have belief system after belief system, all saying the same things, all seeded probably from some original civilization that we, we, we know very little about. Now, you have a whole fascinating section devoted to serpent symbolism, and anyone who's moved around in conspiracy circles will certainly uh, find that has a familiar ring to it. But it seems that when looked at objectively, that this reptilian thing, whatever that happens to be, really does have some sort of profound, fundamental significance to the history of the human race. Yes, it is. I mean, this was, again, the thing that surprised me in my research. I'm not a great, a buy, great buyer into the whole serpent thing, you know, because I, I haven't been, you know, and I find a lot of it sort of rather strange. But having started to read up into it, you find that the, the Anunnaki, um, you know, very much seem to have kind of lizard-like um, ways about them, or at least reptilian. Um, and then you start to look into the, the whole legends Going back, and I'll give an example of this, um, the, the, the legend of the fall, the biblical legend of the fall, you know, and the snake and the serpent. And if we carry this forward, and this is where it gets profoundly strange, is that if you start to read, and again, this is not original work on my part. I, I have to acknowledge that a lot of this work was actually done by a guy called Rabbi Joel Bax, who is a Kabbalistic scholar in Manitou Springs in Colorado in the USA. And Joel has been researching the pineal gland and the role of the pineal gland within Kabbalah um, for many, many years. And he pointed out to me something quite peculiar in that if you take the, um, the legend of the snakes and the legend of the, the lizards and everything else, and you carry it forward to the famous um, biblical allegorical story of Jacob and the ladder, and in Jacob and the Ladder, you have the circumstances where Jacob sees a ladder that goes up to heaven, which is supposedly a form of enlightenment. And it's it's where he his mind becomes opened up to greater things. Now, the biblical name of the place that um, this took place is Pineal. Which, again, is a play on the word pineal now people could obviously argue say well the reason the pineal gland is called the pineal gland is because it looks like a pine cone and therefore that's the reason why there's there's there's, there's, there's similarities in these words but there's more to this than that you know to, to, to say that just because it sounds like something it doesn't mean anything at all but clearly the, the word pine comes back from 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 ancient times anyway so there, there could be some kind of link here and in fact um, Joel calls his whole principle that he teaches on his courses in America the P to the P to P principle, which is the pineal to pineal concept. Now, Joel also has a section which I cite in the book, which you may recall, where he actually does some research into the Torah, and he finds that there's actually lizard symbolism and dragon symbolism within the Torah itself, you know, deep within the writings of um, the Kabbalistic um, writings, there is something that, that symbolizes the snakes. So what are these snakes and what are they symbolizing? And for instance, if you look at the Caduceus, you will see twin snakes, you know, the, the symbol that we have, you know, the, the, the symbol of uh, the, the staff of Hermes, the things that doctors show, you will have twin snakes going up a central pole and linking at the top and at the top of the symbol there will be two wings and a circular disc in the middle. Now Manley P. Hall who was one of the greatest scholars of, of, of esoterica and he was a particular expert in Freemasonry, in his book The Secret of the Ages he discusses this symbolism in great detail and he states that the staff of Osiris is actually a symbol of the pineal gland because the disc that's between the two wings is the pineal gland and the two wings are the hemispheres of the brain. The, the, the staff going down the middle is, the, uh, is the, the, the spinal cord. But what's the symbolism of the two snakes? Then we go back and we look into the, the, the Hindu beliefs of um, the, um, the Kundalini experience. And we find that the Hindus have names for these. As I say, they call it the Ida and the Pingala. 
And the Ida and the Pingala are the channels by which the energy, the prana, enlightens the mind of the person who is being enlightened. So here we have the symbolism again of the snakes. So the snakes are the things that are enlightening people. Now, in the book, um, it is at this stage I start moving into the science. Because, of course, if you look at the snakes and the idea of snakes moving around each other and swirling around each other, that's DNA. Because the symbolism of DNA are, are the twin spirals, the spirals of DNA. Now, the reason this, this whole thing kicked off for me was because around about five or six years ago, I was invited to um, try a machine that was at that stage called Lucia or the hypnagogic light device that had been invented by two Austrians, um, two Austrian researchers, a guy called um, uh, Dirk Prokol, who's a consultant neurologist and a consultant psychologist by the name of Engelbert Winkler. And these guys invited me to Switzerland, to the home of a mutual friend called Evelyn Alassa Valerano, who's a, an expert on near-death experience. And because Engelbert Winkler had read my first book, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, he wanted to meet me. And the reason Engelbert wanted to meet me is that Engelbert had had a profound near-death experience when he was a child. And my book, was the first book he'd read on near-death experiences or allied subjects that that mirrored his experiences quite closely so he was keen to meet me but he was also keen for me to try this machine now i may have discussed this machine in my previous interview i think i did didn't i greg possibly yes you spoke about it but that's fine i mean things have moved on in terms of uh, you know knowledge and experience since then okay well what i'll do is i'll just continue with the, the link as it links into the book quite nicely when I when I was put in front of the lucid light machine, the hypnagogic light device, which, by the way, if anybody is interested out there, this machine is going to be there's going to be an event in Birmingham in um, late October, uh, which I'll be featuring on my my website and on my Facebook site, um, where a group of people in Birmingham uh, are doing a session with a lucid light device. And also, I will have a lucid light device and the two Austrian doctors with me at an event in Brighton on the 2nd of November. I'm sure I'm not sure exactly what the title of the event is, but uh, there are details on my website and I'll remember it later. So that you will get a chance to have a look at this machine if you're in the Brighton area or in the Birmingham area in late October. But suffice to say, the machine surprised me because I was not expecting to have any form of experience. I really genuinely wasn't. I've tried a lot of these machines out in the past and nothing had happened to me. And I thought for a certain extent the same thing was going to happen with this machine because the light started to flash. What happens is it's a kind of it's literally a light device. You, you, you close your eyes and you get um, different intensities of white light and you also get a powerful stroboscopic effect. And what it does is it puts you very quickly into hyp hypnagogia or hypnagogia. That's that kind of liminal state when you're not quite asleep and not quite awake where you see images and everything else. And within about 10 minutes, it placed me into this hypnagogic state where I was seeing a light tunnel, like classical near-death experience light tunnel. And I felt I was being pulled down this tunnel. I also felt that my, my, my body was starting to vibrate. And I felt I had the sensation of almost leaving my body as if it was bringing about an out of the body experience. But what else that happened was most peculiar because um, I could see in my periphery vision um, a kind of breakup of my visual field. Now, I, I suffer from a classical migraine. So I know what a classical migraine scotoma is like. And it was generating a kind of in my periphery vision, a classical migraine scotoma. It's where your visual field starts to break up. And I asked um, the doctors whether I could look away from the light to look at this source that I was perceiving in my extreme right visual field. They said, yes, I could, because my brain had encoded the signals. My visual cortex had encoded them and everything else. So I looked away and I looked down at this 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 fizz field in my, my visual field. And I was stunned at what I saw because what I literally saw, and this is literally what I saw. I mean, I'm not making this up. I've got no reason to make this up. I was hovering above a planet around about 20 or 30 miles up and I could see the curvature of the planet. 
and I could see that the planet's surface was made up of black and white uh, squares running off into the distance. At the edge of the planet was a blue, and there were blue lights running along the edges of the black and white chessboard. And at the edge of the planet was a kind of fizzy blue light. Now, I immediately recognised this. It's the astral plane. It's what's been talked about for centuries. But on top of that, it was mixed with another feature which I'd read about when reading about Carlos Castaneda. It's called the lights of the world. It's a kind of a blue light that you see under certain circumstances. This stunned me, absolutely stunned me, because there were all these occult, there was this occult significance of what I was seeing. But I readily admit I lost my nerve and I actually asked them to switch the machine off because it was so intense. When they were switched the machine off, we started discussing what I'd seen and that I was there with the two doctors together with another associate of mine, one of the world's experts in the deja vu phenomenon, Dr. Arthur Funkhauser, who'd come over from Bern. And Art also had a go on the machine as well. And we're having a discussion. And as we're discussing, something rather peculiar started to happen to me because I started to feel vibrations in the centre of my forehead as if something was was trying to move as if there was a little creature moving it just underneath my skin level and every time I thought about certain things I felt this intense sensation and I felt that it was kind of being transferred from the center of my brain now one of the things that Engelbert Winkler and Dirk Prokol say is that what the the lucid light device does is it stimulates the pineal gland to excrete a, a substance called dimethyltryptamine now, we'll touch upon this a little bit later, but effectively what I believe had happened there was my my pineal gland, my third eye had been opened by this machine. It had literally opened it up in some way. It had caused it to do something different, something neurological. All through that evening, I was having these sensations again and again. I go to sleep in that in those dream sequences. I had vivid, vivid dreams. OK. And these dreams consisted of snakes. I was seeing snakes. And at one stage, there were two huge cobras looking down at me. OK, just looking at me. Now, when I was researching the new book, I got a hold of a book by a guy called Jeremy Narby. And Jeremy Narby's book is called The Cosmic Serpent. Narby describes his initial experience with a substance called ayahuasca which is a brew that is made by the 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 the, um, the the native the native peoples of Amazonia. And this is a very, very strange, powerful brew that can bring about amazing experiences of encounters with with other creatures, other beings. Narby describes this and Narby describes exactly what I sensed, the snakes. In fact, I met Jeremy Narby. Um, he's a, a French Canadian anthropologist this summer at an event called the Breaking Convention at uh, the University of Greenwich. And Narby was one of the speakers of this thing. And I had a chat with him about this. So Narby's experiences were the same as mine. And it was snakes. Now, if you start to read up about ayahuasca and about what ayahuasca is, you find some strange, strange information. One of the great mysteries of ayahuasca is how the Amerindians of that area picked the two so the two plants to mix together in ayahuasca. Now ayahuasca is made up; it is it's effectively a brew. What they do is they take the bark of something called Banisterius capi, which is a kind of a climber. It's a, it's a it's a root that climbs around and around other trees, and they also take another plant, another flower called Psychiatra viridas. And they mix these two together into a drink and they make this brew. They brew it overnight and it turns into this soggy, disgusting liquid, which people then drink. And when people drink it, what happens is, is that the I, I never get this right, but I think it's the Banisterius capi contains dimethyltryptamine. The substance I spoke about before, which, again, we'll come back to later. And it contains dimethyltryptamine. The question is, why do they also have the other plant involved, the Psychiatra viridas? And there's a reason. 
If you just drank a brew made of of the DMT plant, whichever of the two it is, and it went into your stomach, you could drink gallons of this stuff and you'd have no effect. And the reason it would have no effect is within the stomach, there is an enzyme called the MAO inhibitor, the MAO. And what this does is it, it literally stops the DMT having an effect. It nullifies it. However, the other plant, maybe the Psychiatra viridas, has an MAO inhibitor chemical in it. And this chemical mixes with the DMT in the stomach and stops the MAO stopping the DMT being effective and crossing from the stomach into the blood system and therefore into the brain. Now, they only chose two plants. Now, can you imagine you are a comparative, relatively primitive in what we would term tribes. Somehow your shamans managed of the 50 or 60,000 plants that are known in the Amazonian forests, they found the two in exactly the right mixtures to mix together to create ayahuasca. Now, when the anthropologists came across this, they asked the shamans how they had devised this, this particular liquid, this particular drink, this Alexa. Their answer was specific. They said the plants told them. In fact, what they said was that when they went into shamanic trances many centuries ago, they encountered snakes and the snakes told them how to make this brew. And then because the snakes then told them how to do it and they allowed non shamans to experience this, the snakes had actually facilitated communication with themselves through the shamans. This means that the snakes or whatever they symbolize wanted to be found. They wanted people to know they were there. OK, now, who are these snakes? I suggest in the book, as does Jeremy Narby, that the snakes are symbols of DNA. It is our DNA talking to us. Suddenly, our DNA wants us to know that it is sentient and it is intelligent. It is the DNA, I believe, that um, is the symbol of the snakes. I think the, the DNA symbol of the caduceus has been known for centuries. This is why. This is why we have the coil and the snakes, because it's DNA knowing what it looks like. Well, this just lends further credence, really, to the, the snakes and the serpent uh, symbolism that we spoke about earlier. It was really overlapping with that and kind of bringing all those incidences and traditions together and sort of, is this all connected? And really, you know, from what your research discovered, is it, yes, it, it looks like it is. It does. I mean, the, 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 the intriguing thing is now moving on to dimethyltryptamine. Dimethyltryptamine is, has been found in virtually everything virtually every living creature, every living plant has DMT in it. In fact, um, one uh, one um, uh, person actually glibly wrote, it's more surprising if you find a living thing that doesn't have DMT in it. OK, now, the curious thing about dimethyltryptamine is that it's been found in the blood of human beings. And it has been found in brain material, dead brain material. OK, now the argument that's been made for a long time is that it has never been found in a living brain. And in fact, uh, the guys who are listening in who have read um, the Rick Strassman book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, will know that Rick himself states that one of the major problems with the idea that DMT might be endogenous, that is internally generated, is that it's never actually been discovered in the brain because Rick argues that he believes that DMT is the modulator of reality. In fact, it's DMT within the brain that creates the, the illusion of the external world that we live within. Now, just as a little bit of an aside here, um, Rick Strassman is a research psychiatrist at the University of New Mexico. And in the early 1990s, he managed to get a, um, federal funding for a research project into exactly the, what DMT does within the brain 
and what DMT hallucinations are all about. And in the book, he describes in detail, because what they did was they had quite a few volunteers who took DMT. And then they came back and they described their experiences when they were under DMT. And they all described going to a place that was far more real than this one. One of the, the qualitative differences they believe between consensual reality, i.e. the consent, the reality we share with our fellow human beings, and the reality that they go to during a DMT experience is that it is qualitatively far more real than this reality is. So in other words, when you come back to consensual reality after a DMT trip, it's this reality that seems unreal, not the reality you've just been to during the DMT trip. When the people go into DMT experiences, they have very consistent experiences. They, they feel they are in a place that they suddenly recognize. An associate of mine, who is a psychologist, um, took DMT a few years ago, and he told me that he described the experience as being, he took the DMT, and then for a few seconds, nothing happened. And then suddenly he felt like he crashed out of his chest. He said it was like the incident in the movie Alien, where he said he felt he came out of his chest and at great speed went flying through this tunnel of light. He finds himself at the end of the tunnel of light and there are beings looking at him through, through, the, through the light. He can see these figures moving around. And he told me, and it's still one of the creepiest things, he turned around to me and he said, something inside me said, oh, my God, you're back there again. He said there was this profound recognition of this place he was at. It was the place where he normally existed when he's not embodied in the human, in the human mind. Now, Rick Strassman's patients described things that, again, if there are any ufologists out there, will ring bells massively. Sometimes they felt they were in a kind of clinical place where they were being experimented upon. And they were being experimented upon by beings that looked virtually identical to greys. OK, so here we have this link between DMT and the abduction phenomenon. OK, now the greys, the beings themselves were communicating in certain ways in exactly the same way as the entities when people have out of the body experiences or when they have abduction experiences. So there clearly is a parallel here between the two. So what are we dealing with here? Is the is the, the images of the greys, because many people turn around and say that greys seem to be reptilian, they seem to have this kind of coldness about them, like a reptile. Now, is this again the DNA symbolizing itself in some way? Is it the DNA literally a term that I know has been used in ufology for quite a few years? Is cultural tracking in the idea that the DNA will have been, will, will will show itself as snakes in societies that know of snakes and can associate snakes. Whereas as we've advanced, we now have this idea of aliens. Is the DNA literally just embodying itself within the DMT dream sequence to look like greys? Because this is what we understand. Because of course we know that the whole grey ethos and the whole imagery of greys came from originally a book cover um, by um, Oh, Whitley, Whitley Strieber. Whitley Strieber. Now, I had the opportunity. Whitley interviewed me uh, for his show about six or seven months ago. And again, it's well worth listening into if you want to. It's on Whitley's Unknown Country. And it's Whitley and I describing my concept of the daemon and Whitley's abductions. And Whitley and I are in total agreement about what happened to Whitley. And I think it's tied in here with DMT. You, you, you look again at the imagery of, 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 of Whitley's experiences. You also then go back a little bit further in history and you'll find that what Whitley saw was very similar to Awas, who was the being that manifested itself in front of Alistair Crow Crowley. And if you look at Crowley's imagery of, of elementals that, that, that he manifest, they're greys. Or that they're, they're kind of similar to greys. So you have this whole idea of have these elemental beings been with us for centuries? Now, again, I'm bouncing from place to place here. But if you read the works of very early ufologists, people like Jacques Vallée, 
who wrote a book called Passport to Magonia. Uh, you, you read, um, there was another very, very similar book, John Keel uh, uh, and, and his book Project Trojan Horse. These books very early on in the late 60s, early 70s, were describing the idea that the, the UFO phenomenon is not what we think it is. It is tied to the, the, the mythos of, of the way we think, the way our universe works. You know, that we have the brownies, we have the, the, the little people, we have the sea, the seeth in Ireland. All these creatures have similarities. And these similarities, if you start looking into DMT, you realize that this is what's going on, particularly because, you know, you look into the, the, the Celtic cultures and you find that the mythos of, of magic mushrooms. Now, again, magic mushrooms are opening up the brain to these alternate realities. These are all gateways. These are all portals within the brain that are taking consciousness into another level of reality. Now, again, one of the reasons that we consider consensual reality to be consensual is because it's consensual, because we share it. In other words, if you and I both see something, we both agree that that must be an external space because we've shared the experience. However, if we both see something that isn't there, it's called a folie de. If a group of us see something in the sky like they did at, um, at uh, Fatima, you know, where the, the sun spun in the sky, it's then considered to be a collective hallucination. But the whole reason we consider external reality to be real is because we share it with others. People during DMT experiences have had shared DMT experiences where two people have experienced the same thing during a DMT trip. That means that this is just as real as this reality is. They're just elements of the same reality. Now, going back to what um, Rick Strassman said about DMT and there being no evidence of uh, DMT in the brain, this has been one of the major bugbears and the major things that the cynics who are trying to put down a lot of this research say, there is no evidence of DMT in the brain. Get real, it's not there. Well, they need to now get real because there's been developments in the last year, 18 months, that are amazing. And I mentioned these in the book. The first one is they found something called the traits associated amine receptors, T-A-A-R-S, TARS. These are receptor sites in the brain. Receptor sites are particular sites in, in, in neurons that are designed like a lock is to a key. In other words, it's a lock, but the key has to be a particular shape to send the message across the neurons. TARS receptors are designed to work with dimethyltryptamine. OK, so here we have the first evidence that dimethyltryptamine is natural within the brain. It's a neurotransmitter. But that is only evidence by by implication. However, um, around about four or five months ago, uh, uh, a lady researcher called Jimo Borogin uh, at the University of, I think, Mini Minnesota, Minneapolis, somewhere like that, has done a has done some research with a few associates on the brains of rats. They found dimethyltryptamine in the pineal gland of live rats. The reason they do work with rats is because the brain structure of rats is very similar to the human brain. So here we have, for the first time, absolute 100% evidence that DMT is a neurotransmitter of the mammalian brain. This is earth shattering in its implications. The whole re how the brain works is neurotransmitters sending messages across the brain and facilitating how consciousness works. Here we have a neurotransmitter that is the most powerful hallucinogenic drug known to man. This is the final key in the jigsaw puzzle about how consciousness actually functions. Now, again, some of your listeners out there may have, may have picked up a few weeks ago, the Daily Mail and a lot of the press picked up on um, an experiment that had been done, again with the brain of rats, where they'd found that they, they killed these rats. It was disgusting what they did, but they killed the rats. They made them brain dead. They clinically killed them and they were waiting for brain de death to occur. Around about 20 seconds after the brain had been flatlined, of the rats because they were they were testing with it with uh, EEGs and things. There was suddenly a spurt of energy in the brain. 
the brain suddenly lit up greater than it does normal during normal waking life. This was the final throw of a brain before it dies. So what was happening to that rat's brain just before it died? I believe that was the near-death experience taking place. Okay, I'm suggesting rats have near-death experiences. Why not? You know, a rat has a worldview and a rat might just have a near-death experience of a rat-like thing. It is evident then that this is what happens in the human brain. And there has been certain evidence done in this, and I cite some of this in the book, where they have found extreme brain activity just before death. Now, in my first book, Is There Life After Death? The Science of What Happens When We Die, I suggested exactly this around in 2006. And I suggested they will find evidence of this, and they've now found it. This is the DMT kicking in. And the reason I know it's the DMT kicking in is that although it's not being pointed out, it's the same research team. The same research team that was working on DMT is the same research team that was working on the near-death experiences in rats. This is powerful stuff. And this, this is virtually unknown at the moment, and it's not being picked up and ran with. And my book deals with this because I think this is the big breakthrough in terms of brain science. Well, two sort of little additional points connected with that is this tying in with the idea of the brain as a sort of a, you talked about DMT as a modulator of reality. The brain is kind of a um, receptor and broadcaster, you know, higher frequency vibrations, again, modulating this reality. And also in Rick Strassman and others tried to discover, did these alternative realities that people were experiencing under DMT and ayahuasca and similar things, did they actually have any objective reality? And then when you get these commonalities, there's these similar experiences, particularly of people who haven't met or not even in the same continent, it seemed to suggest that if they don't have an objective reality, then something within our brains is causing these similarities in the experience or something within some part of the physiology. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting, this, the way in which, well, many people, most people, fall into the trap of something called naive realism. And it's something used by uh, consciousness scientists to describe the kind of people who believe that the external world that is presented to you by your senses is what is actually out there. And it's not. You know, you, you, know, you look around and you feel, whoa, wow, this is, this is really interesting. This is, must be how it is. Uh, I came across a wonderful term recently called electromagnetic chauvinism. And it's the idea that we believe because we see with the particular part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which stimulates our eyes, which in turn stimulates our um, visual cortex to recreate a reality internally, that therefore that is what we see. And that's what's really out there. And that's what it really looks like. But of course, it doesn't really look like that at all. And a little bit of logic will tell you that. In the book, you may recall, um, I discussed the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, we know that light is a very, very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the light we see is the light that all our eyes perceive. The, I use the analogy in the book and I say the electromagnetic spectrum, if it was stretched to the length of the Mississippi River, that is from a small lake in Minnesota right down to the Gulf of Mexico, it's around about 6,000 miles. That's the equivalent of, say, and if you took that as an equivalent, the, the actual spectrum of what visible light that we see would be about an inch, about six or seven miles south of Hannibal, Missouri. That's it. That's what we see. If, a, if, a, if we could have a conversation with a bat, Thomas Nagel wrote a very, very famous paper, I think in 1971, where he suggested this and he said, what is it like to be a bat? A bat effectively sees using sound. It uses sound location to bounce things off. Its universe and its world and its perception of the world is totally different to ourselves. The same goes with the perception of time. Again, there was a very recent paper published, which again, the press got hold of and didn't really grasp the significance of it. They found that um, the concept of, if the reason you can't usually catch a fly when it flies past you or hit a fly is because the fly is perceiving time in a totally different way to you. 
it perceives time in a much slower way. So we're huge and we're ponderous and they can get out of the way really easily. It's to do with the metabolic rate and how meta metabolism works. But this has huge implications as well because it means a fly may last, live three days, but as far as the fly is concerned, it could be 80 years, which effectively means that time perception is also culturally biased. It's also species biased. So in other words, the universe for a fly or a bumblebee, you know, the way a bumblebee can see far more into the infrared and the ultraviolet spectrum. But a bumblebee's time perceptions are different to ours as well. So how, you know, what a bumblebee sees is completely different. We also have people that suffer from something called synesthesia, where they can actually taste colours. I saw a guy recently, um, or I listened to a guy being interviewed recently on the radio, who said that each tube station in London has a different shape and feeling to him because he, his brain is wired in a different way. I'm reminded of uh, Daniel Tramet's book, Born on a Blue Day. For Daniel Tramet, who has severe synesthesia, each day has a different colour. Now, this is how the brain processes reality. Now, on top of this, a moment's reflection on how sight works. You know, there's a guy called Richard L. Gregory, who's written a series of books on sight and mirrors and how light and how we interact with reality. And again, this is a serious scientist. This is this is not some new age guy. This is a serious guy. This is serious work. You the light we see is not the light that is externally in the external world. And this is profound importance. And I'll come on to the reason why this is profound in a second. Indeed, if you look at a window now, you look at a window in your room, the light that is hitting one side of the window, the photons or the waves, and we won't go there because that gets a whole other question. The photons, the light particles that are hitting that way at that mirror, that window, are not the same light waves that are coming out the other side. And this is for a simple reason that when a light wave, when a photon hits an electron or an atom, what happens is it hits the electrons within the atom and it gets taken in by one of the electrons. It literally energy gets taken into the electron. The electron then loses energy and falls down to a different level within the shell of the atom. In order to do this, it has to give off energy. So it gives off another photon which fires out from the atom. And this happens every time a light wave hits any atom. There are millions of atoms, billions of atoms in your window as you're looking at it. Each light wave, each photon is hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting. So by the time the light wave comes out the other side of the window, it's not the same light wave or the photon. It's not the same photon, even vaguely the same photon. But it gets worse because the photons that are bouncing off I don't know, the, uh, the, the, the objects around you are going into your eye. Not only are they changing as they hit the molecules in the air, they then hit your eye. They go through the lens, they go through the aqueous humor of the eye. They then hit the back of the eye. Those light, those, those light photons are completely different photons. But now it gets weirder because when it hits the back of the eye, that light wave, that light, I keep saying waves, but that, that particle gets changed into an electrical impulse. So it, oh, it's gone. It's now an electrical impulse, which is a different form of electromagnetic energy, which then goes down the optic nerve to the, the back of the brain, the, the, the place where sight is pulled together. It is then recreated by a magical way. Now, remember on top of that, the, the actual retina on the back of the eye the image that hits the back of the eye is postage stamp sized and it's inverted. So this tiny little image that is consisting of photons that were not the original photons and, and electrical impulses is recreated in, the, in, the, in the, the visual cortex, recreated literally to create the three dimensional visual world that you're looking at now. That is impossible. There is something very weird going on. In fact, where is that light coming from that gives you the inner image of light? I argue that that light is coming from and is being processed within your brain 
from the inside, not the outside. And I think the pineal gland is directly responsible for this. Again, people will be bouncing up and down and probably say, no, the pineal gland. Yeah, yeah. Haven't I read somewhere that the pineal gland is a form of eye? Well, it is. In fact, there is a lizard called a tutora, which is found on certain islands off New Zealand. Its third eye, its pineal gland is in the center of its forehead and it sees it actually can process light. OK, now our pineal gland has vestigial compartments to it, which suggest at some stage in the distant past, it was it, it was light. It could see light. But it has to see light anyway for a very important purpose. We know that the pineal gland excretes and generates something called melatonin. At the present moment in time, this is what they believe the pineal gland exists to do. Melatonin is the, 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 the chemical that makes us want to go to sleep. So this is why you take melatonin tablets when sometimes, you know, you're doing a transatlantic flight or something. But the billion dollar question is, how does the pineal gland that's located right in the center of the brain know it's going dark because there is no external light there? The reason it knows is it sits above the optic nerve. The optic chiasma runs just below it and it somehow senses that light is being, is, is being processed by the optic nerve underneath it. Now, it then generates this idea of going to sleep. But imagine a scenario that it can generate internal light by drawing up light from somewhere else. And this light from somewhere else is also known to exist. It's known as bioluminescence or biophotons. We have this issue of this internal light. I have long been intrigued as to when I close my eyes and when I have um, a classic migraine, I see things. I see colored lights, I see swirling lights, I see lots of intriguing things taking place. I've always wondered where that light comes from. I've also wondered where the light comes from that illuminates our dreams. Now, that's not such a bizarre statement as it seems, because, again, let's let's go past. Let's ask more questions, not just stop at single questions. One of my big bugbears at the moment is something I call labeling theory. In other words, if we've labeled something, given it a name, we've explained it. The classic example of this is hallucinations. Oh, somebody's just had an hallucination. Oh, yeah. We've given it a name so we know what hallucination is. No, we don't. We haven't got a clue what hallucinations are. You know, there's one thing knowing that there's certain activity in the brain in certain points. But that's not telling how it is that within the brain there is a sentient something that calls itself I that is actually seeing things and processing things and understanding things. That's a huge leap. It's actually called what David, Char uh, the Australian philosopher, David Chalmers called the hard problem. How it is that there is anything inside there at all. OK, so here we have the, the idea. There's this inner light. Now, recent experiments done by an associate of mine called Professor Istvan Bokken in, in Hungary. He's been working with um, eyes of fr frogs eyes and he's discovered that frogs eyes give off photons. Now, think about that for a second. We naturally assume that the human eye takes in light. It doesn't put it out, but they proved it does. So sometimes when somebody says somebody's eyes are dead, it's because there's no light coming out from them. People say that, you know, that his light, his eyes are alive with light. This is because the eyes give off light and a light that's coming from inside, projecting itself into the external world. Where does this light come from? Where does this electromagnetic energy come from? This electromagnetic energy, Bokken believes, and a lot of researchers believe, and this has been going back years, there's been work done by a guy called Pop at uh, the University of Liverpool many years ago, um, about bio, bioluminescence and biophotons. These, this is actually electromagnetic energy that's given off by cells. In other words, we we generate light internally. The light is drawn up from somewhere. They have recently discovered that DNA itself gives off light. 
So here we're coming right round again to the DNA thing. DNA gives off electromagnetic energy. DNA gives off light. DNA can illuminate. So suddenly when we use this term, inner illumination, seeing the light, suddenly we're in a whole different ball game here. What do people turn around when they have a near-death experience? I see great light. I see light. I see a tunnel of light. I see a being of light. And going down a tunnel towards a point of light. This is all inner light. This is the inner light that mystics have talked about for centuries. We now are doing the science of how this inner light is generated. Now, I believe that the inner light itself not only is it processed by the pineal gland, but it is facilitated by the pineal gland excreting dimethyltryptamine. Now, as Rick said, this is an interesting argument that dimethyltryptamine is probably responsible for the near-death experience because the similarities between near-death experiences and um, the experiences of people who have um, uh, NDEs. I also consider that DMT is responsible for lucid dreaming. I also believe it's responsible for the out of body experience. I think all these phenomena are linked and it's one of my aims in life is to be somebody who brings together ideas from disparate areas and says, look at these in toto, look at them together, join the dots and see what pictures come forward. Don't just work away in isolation. Now, I'm now working fairly closely with um, a guy I mentioned earlier on, um, Professor Irvin Laszlo. And indeed, Laszlo and I are now writing a book together, which will be out next year, published, published in the States by Inner Traditions, where we're actually discussing evidence for consciousness outside of the brain. And the idea that the brain is effectively um, a, a receiver of consciousness. In other words, it attunes into a consciousness field and consciousness exists outside. Consciousness is far more complex than we think it is. So when we have traces, when somebody does a, an EEG trace on somebody's brain or a PET scan and they see the activity in the brain, they're confusing that thinking the activity itself is what is bringing about the, the, the experience of thinking or whatever. They're getting it wrong. It's the experience of thinking that is bringing about the activity in the brain. In other words, we've got it completely the wrong way round. In other words, it's like trying to take a car, take a part a motorbike to find speed, you know, or th genuinely believing that when you're watching a TV program, that the TV studio is actually in inside the TV. And of course, it isn't. This is the category error we are making with consciousness. If anything, the brain is an attenuator. It actually takes out information. It doesn't. It keeps information from us because. The reality, reality internally and reality externally are all parts of the same thing. One of the, the points of view that people sometimes accuse me of is being a dualist. The idea that I believe that there is mind and matter and the two things are different things. You know, you know, it's the, the critique that they put on Descartes and various other people. I'm not. I'm a non-dualist. I, I completely believe there is only one substance in the universe, and that is consciousness. Consciousness is the baseline of everything. This, again, is what the Buddhists believe. It's what the Hindus believe. You know, we can say, oh, these are archaic religious beliefs that, that bear no relevance to modern science. They bear huge relevance to modern science because they're giving us clues as to what is really taking place. We naively assume, as I said earlier, that external reality is physically out there. <laughs> really? We know that what reality there is, is 99.99% empty space, literally empty space. And we know if we take a, an, an atom apart and take it part into the nucleus and the electrons whizzing around, the electrons themselves are non-physical in the terms that they're kind of bits of energy. And this is where we come round back to full circle now, because if consciousness is a field of energy, what is this energy? What is this energy that, and where is this light coming from? I believe that the light is coming from something called the zero point field. And again, this is not original, and I readily acknowledge this is not original. A lot of fascinating work has been done in this area by another associate of mine called Professor Bernard Heche. 
and indeed by as uh, Irvin Laszlo as well. In fact, the three of us did a um, a, a lecture podcast um, for um, IONS, the um, uh, American Institute of Noetic Science, two months ago, where the three of us were discussing these things. The idea is that the zero point field is where everything is encoded. The zero point field is effectively the hard drive by which the universe functions and works. The zero point field is, um, and zero point energy is a form of energy that exists within everything. It, 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 space is not empty. Space is not a vacuum. Space is the complete opposite of vacuum. It is, it is full of, of energy, this zero point energy. And zero point energy um, has been postulated for quite a long time. There is certain evidence there's something called the Casimir effect, for instance, that suggests that there's a form of energy coming down. They've also, when they have um, taken particles and frozen them down to uh, just below, just above absolute zero, they find that there's still some energy coming up from somewhere that is coming up, not going down, which suggests that this, this form of energy exists at, um, at uh, absolute zero. And of course, absolute zero by definition is the coldest it can possibly be. And cold means there is no energy. Nothing is moving. So effectively, there shouldn't have been no energy, but there is. Now, if this is the case, this means that space is absolutely full of this energy. Now, this is the energy that, 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 that brings about this light. Now, again, there has been recent work done about where they have... Um, been playing around with light. I don't know if you've seen this, whereby they've announced that they've, they've been able to create physical things made out of light photons. What they haven't actually fully said, but it is clear from reading the papers that what they're talking about here is zero point energy. You know, so again, all it is is the same form of energy that, that myself and Laszlo and H bang on about again and again and again. So here we have a model of reality that is revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. And in the infinite mind field, I try to pull this all together. Now, the final point I'd like to make is what is the background? What, where is all this leading? Well, I believe it's leading to a fascinating implication. If the zero point field is a form of energy and it is everywhere, that means it is omnipotent, omniscient, and it just is everything. Is the zero point field what we would normally call the Godhead? I don't use the word God because that has certain pejorative ideas, but the idea of the base intelligence of everything. If that is the case, we effectively are forms of energy ourselves and we are parts of that greater something. Now, again, Bernard Heche has written a book called The God Theory. And in The God Theory, this is exactly what he suggests. He suggests that there's just a field of consciousness. And we are just like waves on an ocean of consciousness that we exist for a few a short time. We go back into the sea of consciousness. A guy called Dr. Martin W. Ball, who's an anthropologist, has come up with something he calls the entheological paradigm. And in this, he suggests that when we actually take DMT and other entheogens, because effectively the technical term for DMT and other substances that facilitate an awareness of the God within is called, are called entheogens. That's what the word means. Now, if this is the case, it suddenly makes that very famous monologue, which I end the book with, by um, Bill Hicks. And I turn around and I, say, and I say, Bill Hicks turned around and said, and I will read it properly. Today, a young man on acid realized that all matter is merely energy condensed into slow vibration that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, that there's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream and we're the imagination of ourselves. And I think that sums up totally, completely and utterly the hold of my whole of my book, The Infinite Minefield, in that one phrase. Cutting edge science, quantum physics, is beginning to tie a lot of this together in terms of formulas and equations that Western scientific reductionist minds can grasp. And it's revealing to us that there are ideas and concepts here that are both ancient and universal. But this idea of DNA being somehow intelligent and or sentient 
um, once again raises the, the issue of so-called junk DNA, non-coding DNA, which is 90% of human DNA. I mean, that's not there for no reason. It would serve no evolutionary purpose. And this all also overlaps with the idea of the universe being energy, basically at its fundamental root, and with us being energetic beings, affecting all and being affected by all. You know, for example, the idea of solar energy, cosmic rays having an effect on us and our DNA. And really, there, it poses the question as to what the fundamental connections are here. Very much so. Um, one of the um, suggestions, my publisher Watkins, who published The Infinite Minefield, did did suggest to me that maybe I should consider writing a book on uh, non-coding DNA, purely and simply because this is where science is leading. You know that by the law of parsimony, we know that nature doesn't doesn't waste its time with things. Things are there for a reason, um, and I think that uh, junk DNA and raised commas um, could be where the, the 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 real breakthrough will take place. I was surprised to discover, and I mentioned this in the book, that um, DNA itself has a language and it has a syntax. You know, so the coding within DNA works like a language. So here we have a hidden language, in which case, you know, we, we know what four letters, five letters, and how many letters there are in the DNA we know at the moment. But there's an argument to say that maybe there's, there are all kinds of codings within um, non-coded DNA, which just we can't read the letters, we can't read the language yet, in which case we are actually reading just a very, very small part of a, a huge library of information, uh, effectively what um, uh, Jorge Borges, the um, Argentinian writer, would call the Library of Babel. You know, and we are in this position, and I think that there will be a link made between DNA and zero-point energy soon, because I think that this, this zero-point energy is in fact imagine where we are living in a, the universe we live within is a super duper computer game all that is happening is that we are existing within a computer game which is actually created by the zero point field and in which case every possible event that can take place will take place and again before people criticize me they're saying that sort of nonsense i suggest they actually check out a paper written in 2006 by Stephen Hawking and his associate Thomas Hertog, who's a research physicist at CERN, and they came up with something they call the top-down hypothesis of quantum physics. And in this, they suggest that the every outcome of every action is already encoded within the field. All that happens is the act of observation of a sentient observer or the act of measurement collapses that particular wave function rather than another wave function. So effectively, here we have, you know, one of the world's leading scientists going down the same path. That's why I think the idea of materialist reductionism and spirituality is exactly the same thing as being dual or non-dual. You know, it, it's 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 labeling. It doesn't mean anything. You know, effectively, we need to start thinking outside of these boxes, stop criticizing each other and starting to realize that we're both all of us trying to search for answers and maybe there are elements of both our areas that can be used to come to interesting conclusions and that's my role i get criticized by um, people the, on the new age wing i get heavily criticized i get heavily criticized by materialist reductionist scientists i don't really care they can criticize me till the cows come home um they need to engage with me and people like myself because we are coming to very some very very interesting conclusions and conclusions that might have profound influence for the way we understand the future of the world. A couple of points here. Firstly, uh, being the idea of self-referential consciousness, might, that might actually be a negative evolutionary development. I mean, some say consciousness is just an anomaly of the brain, but nature doesn't tend to do pointless developments. But then what evolutionary advantage would this self-referential consciousness confer? Uh, there might be some larger, as yet not understood, evolutionary purpose. But as things stand, with research, but more importantly with how we actually experience ourselves and consciousness, it doesn't seem to make sense that this phenomenon arose from the primordial ooze by accident and without purpose. Exactly. And that really brings us right down to the really nub of this question. As you rightly say, self-referential consciousness is not necessary. In fact, it brings about such things as altruism, uh, which which is, is not conducive to survival of the fittest. 
you know, so so there are the curious things here. And as somebody I re recently it was pointed out to me by and I can't remember, it was some research scientist that said if the outcome of evolution was to literally make a creature that was the most effective within its environment, we needn't have evolved from the amoeba because the amoeba is, is very effective within its environment. In fact, if you look at some of the, the, the other living creatures, an ant colony is extremely effective, you know, and they have existed for millions and millions of years, hundreds of millions of years. So therefore, to say that consciousness evolving was pointless, unless there's a purpose for consciousness. And there are more and more scientists coming round to the belief that this is an observer-based universe that the universe has been hardwired since the first moments of the Big Bang. And again, if you read the Cos Cosmic Anthropic Principle book and uh, the Goldilocks Enigma and various other books, you can actually see just the chances of this universe, if it's the only universe. And of course, we could use multi-universes, in which case we are existing in the only universe, the universe that would happen to be right, but there's billions of others that haven't been, which I can quite live with. But the idea that we were hardwired to evolve in this universe in order to bring it into existence by observation. Now, people will turn around and say, hold on a minute, how can a sentient being, a self-referential sentient being that exists now, bring into existence things that happened millions of years ago, billions of years ago, the Big Bang itself? Well, we observe the, 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 the endings of the Big Bang. We look at the edge of the universe. You know, we're receiving the light waves and the electromagnetic waves from millions and billions of years ago, which are then triggering our receivers here. In other words, we are collapsing by observing. When you look in a telescope and you look at the Andromeda galaxy, you're collapsing the wave function of those, those waves of light that are actually coming from the Andromeda galaxy. And you're bringing them into existence, even though they were generated, what, I don't know, 13, 14 million years ago. So this is intriguing in itself. And again, John Wheeler came up and again, one of the world's top research physicists came up with the same kind of concept that it's an observer based universe. Is it Julian Jeans, John Jeans? I can't remember that, but Jeans anyway, came up with something the sound. He, he's coming, he came around to the quote where he said, I think more and more I, I look at science and come to the conclusion that the whole of the universe is a great thought. And this is it intelligence, consciousness and observation is the baseline of reality. And to be honest, as a final point, this is the only thing we can ever know. The only thing I can ever know is that I am a sentient something observing something. Everything else is periphery. Everything else could be just an illusion given to me by my senses because I don't know any different. Well, I'll just offer one closing thought. Which is not mine, but I'll offer it up anyway. It's uh, simultaneously poetic and melancholy. And it comes from a book called Inner Paths to Outer Space. Uh, it's put together by Rick Strassman and several others. No doubt you've read it. And the idea is that the universe itself is a manifestation of a singular consciousness. One entity, forever, past, present and future. However we understand those nebulous concepts. And this entity is so overwhelmed by its own loneliness, which is our loneliness, yours, mine, everyone's. And so consciousness is forgetting itself, hiding from itself by becoming you, me, and every seemingly separate form that exists. Absolutely spot on. That's one of the points I make in the book as well. And indeed, uh, just referencing my other book that came out yesterday, day before my biography of Philip K. Dick. Um, Philip K. Dick, the American science fiction writer, came up with a very similar idea uh, in various of his books, but particularly his book, um, uh, The Divine Invasion, uh, where he was suggesting that God himself has forgotten he's God. He's suffering from something, amnesis, and anamnesis is the, the reawakening of the realization of your own divinity. Now, it's Again, my, my associates at the Walker Group, who are a group of people that get together on Merseyside and we discuss ideas, we discussed this a few years ago when we said, you know, is it possible that, that God has embodied himself within the universe and has, and has deliberately chosen to not remember who he is 
in order to experience things as we experience things. In other words, he's, he's creating his own soap opera. Now, I know that it's, um, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's trying to make something we can't understand into something we can. But if you can imagine, if you were God, the, the everything that is everything, it's bloody boring. You know, effectively, as he knows everything, so therefore, what's the point on even striving to do anything? He actually knows the outcome of everything that we'd ever do. So that's what he does. He embodies himself and allows himself to forget and lives through us. And I think that's a very beguiling, powerful image. And I think that it makes sense to me because it's 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 theistic without being monotheistic. In fact, it's panpsychism. You know, which, again, has been a theme throughout philosophy for centuries. You know, the idea that everything that is, is God. You know, it, it's the idea that everything is. It's not the idea that God is in the trees or in the plants. Everything is. Everything that is contained within. But this is going back to the Kabbalah. If you go into the Kabbalah, it's the, the, the or Ein Sof. It's the everything. This is what God is as far as the Kabbalah is concerned. So there's nothing earth shattering in these assumptions, it is very much the idea that we are trying to interpret the ideas and we keep coming up with the same ideas time and time again. But for the first time, I would like to believe that we now have the science to be able to draw these conclusions scientifically. Of course, the question is, why are we being allowed to do this? Because if God wants himself to not be known and to have been forgotten who he is, why am I and various other people being allowed to write about the fact that God has forgotten who he is? What makes, why is this? Is this because we're in some form of point in history that we have to become self-aware because the way the world is going, the way the, the, we are destroying our environment, something has to give because at the moment we're facing complete destruction of our environment, our planet, our fellow human beings. God has got to wake up because at the moment he's not doing a good job of his nice little soap opera. Well, that is indeed a profound and thought provoking note on which to end. Anthony, we've been discussing your recent book, The Infinite Mindfield. So perhaps you'd like to tell listeners about that, uh, your other book about Philip K. Dick, that's out at the moment, uh, your website and just anything else that you'd like to share. Yep, sure. Uh, the Infinite Minefield is um, probably the pulling together of um, my what 15 years of research, really, and the feedback I'm getting. It, it's it's been popping up at number one quite regularly on the parapsychology section of Amazon UK. So I'm really pleased with the sales, uh, and my publisher is also delighted. And we're getting quite a lot of positive feedback about the book. Um, I've written a series of other books, Is There Life After Death? The Extraordinary Science of What Happens When We Die, which is my take on the near-death experience. I then followed that with a book, The Daemon, A Guide to Extraordinary Secret Self, which is about the idea of duality of consciousness. Um, I then moved on to the out-of-body experience. Um, I then wrote a book called The Labyrinth of Time, which looks into time perception, which I touch upon and I touched upon in here. Uh, I also co-edited a book uh, called Making Sense of Near-Death Experience um, with two Australian uh, consultant psychiatrists, which funnily enough last year was nominated for Psychiatric Book of the Year by the British Medical Association. We didn't win it, but we were highly commended. Um, then we have The Infinite Minefield, which came out, uh, what, last month. Uh, a couple of days ago, my next book, um, Philip K. Dick, um, a, a Life of Philip K. Dick, The Man Who Remembered the Future, which is a new biography and analysis of the life and the works of Philip K. Dick using my particular approach to reality. Uh, this has involved me in interviewing a lot of people that knew Phil, including two of his ex-wives. Uh, and getting a lot of information from there, which is probably going to be interesting to a lot of science fiction readers and people just interested in my own work. Um, the book I have just finished the writing of is um, the book with uh, Irving Laszlo, uh, which will be out ne this time next year. And literally over the next few days, I've started work on uh, another manuscript, which is yet to get a publishing deal, which will be a fictionalized account of my ideas and hypothesis placed in a fictional environment so I can really pull out the ideas. I've taken um, a little known historical character and I'm going to write his life based upon um, my own ideas of what reality really is. 
And that is about it for now. But um, there are ideas popping out all the time. So, Greg, thank you very much for having me on the show. Um, and uh, I look forward to um, future interviews with you. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the show, please check out the website. That's legalizefreedom.com, legalize-freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including world affairs, politics and economics, science and technology, religion and spirituality, conspiracy, and alternative history. You can also browse and buy a range of books and DVDs from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.